Hello and welcome to our webinar on how to follow what's going on in Parliament. Um, my name is Daniela Wolf. I'm Trainee External Relations Officer here at NCBO and this is my colleague Chris Walker who is Senior External Relations Officer at NCBO. Um, we're also joined by our webinar organizer Lauren today. And now to start, I'm just going to give you a quick overview um, of the webinar. So we'll start with a 30-minute presentation by Chris, and then we will move on to a 15-minute Q&A. So if at any point during the webinar you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the question box, which should be at the bottom of your dashboard. And then at the very end, um, when you exit the webinar, please could we ask you to complete our short follow-up survey, which will just help us you know, give us an idea of what you like, what you didn't like, and where we can improve. Now over to Chris. Um, thank you very much, Daniela. Um, so um, today I'm going to be going through the main ways we can keep on top of uh, parliamentary business. I've picked out nine particular ways I'm going to um, go through. Um, some of these might be familiar uh, for some of you, um, but I wanted to make sure um, that I'm kind of comprehensive. Uh, for those of you who don't work with the parliamentary website, or kind of in Parliament on a day-to-day -day -day basis. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about how you might um, use some of those to help you keep on top of the agenda. Um, and then I'll also come, uh, cover some of the uh, free resources that are out there um, that can help you to monitor what's going on um, as well. Um, just to say, I'll have a lot of links up on the screen as we go through. Um, you can make a note of those if you want, um, but we're going to send those to you uh, later in the follow-up email um, so you don't need to. Um, so the first um, thing we thought we'd kick off with uh, is a poll. Um, so just to kind of get a sense of um, why is it that people want to kind of keep in touch with what's going on um, in Parliament. Um, so the question we've got here is, uh, so why do you want to follow Parliament? So uh, what reason is it that you're kind of, uh, or the main reason, because I think there can be a number, uh, that you want to make sure you keep in touch with what's going on. So um, we've got some options there for you. Um, it might be that you kind of see it as an opportunity to raise uh, your organisation's profile, and um, you might see it as an opportunity to influence uh, specific debates or legislation that's going through Parliament. Uh, perhaps you want to find out about uh, changes to policy or legislation, um, or keep on top of the political agenda. Um, and perhaps there's another reason um, that we haven't thought of as well. So we just kind of wait for you to um, give your answers, um, which should hopefully be uh, appearing fairly soon. Um, and so I think all those are all kind of legitimate reasons um, uh, to keep in touch. Um, oh, so that's good. That's very interesting. Thing. Um, so most of you wanted it to uh, specifically to be influencing um, debates and legislation that are going on. Um, so interesting, actually, that none of you have kind of thought about it in that sort of uh, idea of raising the profile, which I, I don't know, I, for me, that does feel like kind of quite important, but perhaps, but perhaps it's not the main reason, it's more of a kind of secondary thing. Um, but we're going to start, okay, then. Now we kind of know why, uh, why you want to be following what's going on with um, taking a look at um, uh, what is actually uh, what we mean when we talk about... Um, apologies. Uh, um, is uh, going on in Parliament. So the first thing I want to look at is kind of the main business uh, for the week. Um, so every week the government announces in Parliament what's going to be covered in the next week uh, or two. Um, so that's all of the legislation that's going to be passing through its um, various stages, um, all of the debates that can be happening, so whatever the format of those debates. Um, all questions being included as well um, in the business, but uh, they follow a sort of set timetable over a, a five-week cycle, so they're not actually announced every week. Um, and we'll come on to kind of how those how those work a little bit later. Um, incidentally, if you're wondering why this is a government announcement uh, rather than say the speaker or some other kind of parliamentary uh, route, um, so the government and opposition whips uh, agree between them how long it's going to be set aside for certain things like debates. Uh, legislation as well. And so this is known as the, uh, this quite euphemistic term you might have heard, uh, the usual channels. Uh, it's a phrase you hear quite a lot in Parliament, um, and all it means is negotiations between um, different parties' whips. Um, so, 
Uh, in terms of the business itself, um, so the reason I think why this is important um, is it gives you an overview of all the major debates that are going to take place in Parliament, um, which is going to allow you to make sure that you can brief MPs uh, or peers on what's going on. Um, so, for example, MTBA, I want to be aware if there are any debates or questions on uh, charities where our expertise might be able to help. Um, I also want to make sure that if there are any bills of monitoring, I know um, when they're going to be um, discussed. Um, so you can find all of this out on the parliamentary calendar. Uh, it's updated every Thursday. So there is actually a kind of business statement announced in Parliament. So uh, if you want, you can kind of watch that, uh, watch the stream of that, or watch it on BBC Parliament or whatever. Um, or but you can just come back and kind of check the calendar later in the day. Um, so I, I put a note in my diary uh, to remind you to check kind of every Thursday afternoon in case I've missed it. Um, and basically that just means that if there is anything going on that we can easily brief on. Um, we've got as much notice as possible. We can get it to uh, parliamentarians kind of early enough for them to kind of take it in and incorporate it into um, what they're going to uh, be saying. Um, so looking at the uh, page itself, um, so here we've got the kind of uh, very straightforward, uh, we've got the different days on which things are coming. So this is uh, uh, all of the sitting days uh, will have uh, business on them. Um, and then kind of looking down at these tabs, we've got House of Commons uh, is there, so you can look at all the stuff that's going on with Commons, um, but remember you've also got the um, Lords as well. Um, one thing just to kind of remember is that the Lords do announce some business, um, so particularly kind of questions for short debates, uh, much further in advance. So actually you can kind of go much further in advance on the Lords, and sometimes you can get, rather than a week's notice that you get for most stuff going on in Parliament, uh, you can like get uh, several weeks, even a couple of months sometimes, um, so that you can plan what you're going to be able to um, brief on. Um, so in both the Commons and the Lords, uh, the business will start with questions and then move on uh, to the main business of the day. Um, worth being aware that the business can actually change on the day, um, so that's if the government decides to make an oral statement, uh, if they need to announce something, um, or if the Speaker grants an urgent question uh, to an opposition MP. Um, these take place kind of after the uh, scheduled oral questions um, and then before the rest of the day's um, business. So sometimes your legislation you've been planning for can get just pushed back a little bit um, later on in the day. Um, so talking now uh, about oral questions, um, so as I mentioned, uh, these are kind of uh, these go on a five-week cycle. Um, so they're they're always time to have advice. You know when they're going to come. Uh, all regular sessions. Um, questions themselves are published uh, a few days before the session, uh, so we will take a look at the uh, what the question page itself looks like, um, but we'll also take a look at the timetable so you can get a sense of how you can um, keep in touch uh, with what's going on. Um, so uh, looking at uh, the future questions, so once questions are published, for the different sessions uh, when MPs can get pulled out of the ballot. This is what it sort of looks like. Um, so this is an opportunity to kind of go through and see uh, if there are any on which you can have a specific expertise which you might be able to then uh, brief to uh, MPs for a question. Uh, worth saying as well that um, when you're watching, um, other people not on this list will get called. Uh, and the reason for that is because um, there is a kind of convention that the speaker should follow a government MP uh, with an opposition MP and vice versa. So it kind of needs to go between each side to sort of make it fair. Uh, so this is why when you watch things like uh, PMQs, you'll see lots of MPs um, who aren't on the order paper kind of standing up between questions because they want to be um, called in that debate uh, in those questions. Sorry. Um, so um, as I say, there's an opportunity to uh, brief. Uh, MPs once this question's been uh, once the question's been published, um, but it's actually much better to get them to table proactively, which is where uh, the timetable um, comes in. So uh, the uh, question timetable um, sets sets out in advance when um, different question sessions are going to be. Um, just a couple of things to note. So there's uh, a couple of sections to be aware of. So question time. This is when uh, this is the date on which the session will actually be on. Um, and when people will be asking their questions in the House. 
um, but then also be aware that the, ta the, the tabling deadline which comes before. So if you want to kind of brief uh, an MP to ask a, a specific question, you need to make sure you get it to them before that tabling deadline and it kind of lists uh, all of those um, things there. Um, so, for example, how we might use that uh, when we wanted to make sure that business rate relief uh, for charity was protected in the budget, uh, we could have asked a friendly uh, MP uh, if they were willing to table a treasury question uh, to make sure that it was on the um, chancellor's agenda uh, and make them know that if they were uh, if they were going to do something about it, they were going to have a bit of a, a fight on their hands. So sometimes you can use that thing to flag um, some of those issues. Um, so the other thing, just to note on here, you'll see some of those questions have got a sort of green T next to them. Uh, all that means is that the, uh, the session has um, some topical questions. So in the same way that Prime Minister's questions, there's uh, normally uh, they're normally open questions, uh, just on kind of uh, all of the responsibilities of the government. Uh, a topical question or question session in Parliament is uh, it can just be any question on the which relates to the work of the, of the department. So it gives um, MPs a bit more room uh, for manoeuvre in terms of the questions uh, um, they ask. Um, so I'm going to move on to talk about uh, written answers and statements. So these are kind of kept in the same uh, same place on the website. Um, so you've got your written answers, uh, which are the government responses to questions by MPs and peers, and written statements, which are where government uh, departments make announcements on things like policy changes, um, for example. Um, so uh, written questions, I think, in particular, can be quite useful. Um, I think generally there are so many of them tabled that you probably have to know about a question, which would be really useful um, to you. Um, but obviously, written questions are a little bit easier to get MPs to put down. So a uh, kind of good way of um, influencing things as well. Um, so for example, when uh, the government introduced the anti-lobbying clause into grant agreements, uh, we were suggesting questions for MPs to table, uh, and we could use those to really focus on what the detailed implication of the policy um, was going to be. Um, but we also found actually that a lot of MPs were uh, tabling questions independently, um, so we could use that page to keep track as well. So I'll show you uh, kind of what the page uh, looks like. Um, so, um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, this is how it looks. So you can, there are a few different ways you can search. So you can search by keyword. Uh, you can search um, for the uh, by the member who's asked a particular question, um, and you can also, um, if you know uh, the specific number of the question, you can kind of enter that in, and it will it will come up um, for you as well. Um, uh, so um, written statements are on this uh, middle tab here. Um, they, so in the morning, um, there is a list of written statements for the day is published. So if you take a look at that come in the morning and you see that um, there's something that you think might be of interest to you uh, that you might want to uh, comment on or might have implications for you, uh, then you can go get this page up and uh, you can uh, do what I often find myself doing, which is just because uh, they're published as they are uh, on the website as they are released. Uh, so I often find myself kind of refreshing the page, uh, trying to, uh, hoping, they will, hoping they'll come through. Um, so uh, that's kind of just a useful way of keeping on top of that. Um, this third tab here is the uh, daily report. Um, and that lists all of the written um, answers and statements on a particular day. Um, I have to say I don't often use this myself. Um, because it's a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack, um, but it is there if you need it and you just want to get a, a sense of everything that's been um, tabled by someone, everything that's happening. Um, so moving on from uh, written answers and statements, um, one of the most important ways uh, to be able to influence what's going on is through legislation. Um, so each bill um, that goes before Parliament has got its own page. Um, and that includes relevant information about um, sort of future dates, when things can be heard, and what's the bill as well. I mean, it also um, has uh, links to debates at all stages, and I <clears throat> tend to find that it's actually easier to find on individual bill pages than it is through um, some of the other sources where you're kind of uh, finding it a bit difficult to search for the, for the title of the bill. Um, so this is, this is not what the page looks like, but it's just a couple of um, things that I think are particularly useful. So, bill page itself has a lot of, kind of bill documents that it um, that it includes that are really important to know about. Um, so, something that I find particularly useful, um, especially if you're coming to a bill uh, later on, is the track changes version um, of bills. 
Um, so what these do is they include amendments as changes rather than just publishing the new text. Um, so it's actually a lot less work for you to do in understanding what's changed and what amendments have been passed. Um, so just a little, kind of little bit more user friendly, I think. Um, uh, so explanatory notes, uh, they have a section as well. Um, and this, these are kind of documents that just explain in more detail what the bill is doing and what each um, particular clause is doing um, as well. And then um, I think probably the bit you'll use most during the passage of a bill, um, you've got the uh, amendment papers. Um, so these are updated daily uh, when at least one amendment has been tabled at a relevant stage. Um, and that's going to give you a steer on uh, what you do need uh, to be for and what you don't need to be for. Um, so, for example, uh, in the last session, when the uh, National Citizen Service Bill uh, was going through, uh, we wanted to keep a close eye on what amendments were being tabled. Uh, and we'd suggested some amendments to peers ourselves that we wanted to kind of you know, um, keep an eye out for, and we're also seeing what other people had, um, had tabled as well. Um, and once we have those in front of us, then we could um, look look at what we wanted to brief on and make sure we were able to kind of fully influence um, what was going on um, in the bill. Um, <clears throat> so aside from that kind of the bills, uh, another thing to be aware of, and this is particularly important in light of uh, Brexit and Peel Bill, is uh, secondary legislation. So um, uh, one of the big impacts of uh, Brexit is going to be this, uh, the fact that uh, there's going to be a significant increase in the amount of secondary legislation. Um, so I don't want to kind of get too bogged down in the, uh, the detail of secondary legislation and the different types. Um, so just want to give you a quick overview. Um, so major UK laws uh, will be set out in primary legislation, uh, and that has to go through uh, both houses of parliament, and is subject to quite significant uh, parliamentary scrutiny. Um, but primary legislation, legislation also can create powers for ministers uh, to do things through secondary legislation. Uh, and these are normally tend to be the more technical things. Um, so uh, a lot of fees, for example, um, you don't want it in primary legislation because you want to kind of upgrade things through inflation. So you'll set it out in secondary legislation so you can do it a bit quicker. Um, but the kind of challenge for this is that uh, secondary legislation um, is much harder to scrutinise. Um, it normally goes through part of the form of uh, statutory instruments. Um, there are different types, but a lot of it doesn't get seen by uh, MPs at all, and uh, they, uh, the bits that do uh, tend to go through um, pretty easily, and they, they can't be amended as well. So uh, this is why there is this kind of primary uh, piece of secondary legislation um, debate that you're here. And um, so the big uh, reason that Brexit is going to have an impact on this um, is because uh, the uh, repeal bill, uh, which is going to be going through uh, in the autumn, uh, now known as the EU withdrawal bill, um, its primary purpose is to transfer uh, the body of EU law um, that exists over to UK law. Um, but a number of technical changes are going to need to be made um, to make sure that the, work, uh, the law functions properly when we leave the EU. Um, and so these are going to be made through um, secondary legislation. Um, so I think charities will need to be um, more vigilant than they perhaps have been in the past about secondary legislation uh, than normal uh, to ensure that um, any technical changes that are going through don't have substantive policy consequences that um, could cause um, problems. Um, so, as I said, um, today probably isn't the place to get too far into those um, issues, um, but I do want to just um, flag how you can be aware. Of, of these. Um, I have to say, uh, in short, that it's pretty difficult to keep on top of these. Um, so there is this list that I've got here on the screen. There are a lot of them, which makes it hard to keep on top of them. And they, all, they also, um, you can't necessarily know exactly what they are from the title. So um, there's a lot of uh, kind of looking at them to kind of get a sense of what. Um, what they will do and, and which bits of the law they're, um, they're referring to. Um, so um, there are some paid services um, that will track uh, track these, which are uh, very good. Um, but because there is so much work required, they're also very expensive. So for a lot of charities, I think they won't be um, cost effective, I suspect. Um, so I think probably um, at the moment, I think the best way 
is probably to make sure that you're linked in with relevant departments um, and getting regular updates. And I think that's not obviously not ideal, but um, that's the best advice I can give to you um, at the moment. And um, I should say as well, I think this is something that government and parliament are really going to have to look at because um, the secondary legislation is going to take on a new importance. Um, I think it's definitely something they need to look at in making sure that it's something that, that people can follow a bit more easily. So uh, we'll certainly be um, pushing um, for that. Um, the next thing I want to take a look at is um, select committees. So select committees is uh, a really good opportunity um, to uh, scrutinise government and, and wider policy. Um, so in the Commons, um, you have uh, generally these are the committees that shadow different government departments um, and there are a couple of ones which have slightly broader remits uh, such as the Public Accounts um, Committee um, uh, and don't forget as well you've got Lords Committees as well so, um, as well as the sort of permanent Lords Committees um, you also have each year uh, four uh, year-long inquiries at ad hoc committees are set up so um, last year we had the uh, Lord's uh, Select Committee on uh, Charities, uh, which was published earlier this year, and we are now kind of going into the, uh, the Lord's Committee on uh, Citizenship and Civic Engagement. So we're starting to get quite used to these um, ad hoc committees, I think. Um, but I think it's worth kind of just being aware of the Lord's because perhaps sometimes people don't, um, they might find it a little bit harder to get people to engage. So uh, I think they're particularly keen to, uh, to get people involved. Um, so each committee has got a page. Uh, on the website which um, sets up what they do and also importantly has things like um, contact details for committee staff so if you want to talk directly to the staff and um, find out what, you know, how you might be able to help them um, then that's going to be useful for you as well. Um, so just a quick look at um, uh, what the pages look like so um, key things to be aware of I think are here you can find out uh, a little bit more on this but uh, you can find out what inquiries are currently being um, carried out uh, by a committee, um, and this will kind of like this will list uh, the progress they've made as well. So we know whether they're still taking missing evidence or if they've moved on to, to oral evidence. Um, and then if you want to find something that's already been published, say whether it's reports um, that the committee has done previously, um, or also um, when you've got uh, when transcripts of, um, of the committee meetings have been published as well, you might want to um, take a look on that. And the other thing I just want to kind of flag on this page um, is that uh, you can subscribe to um, email alerts from um, committees as well. So when they do post um, something new, um, you should get uh, an email about it. Um, so I'm going to have a quick look at um, uh, the House of Lords. Um, so uh, we've got another poll question for you to have a look at. Um, and what we thought might be interesting is looking at uh, some of your experiences working with the Lords uh, compared to the Commons. So, how easy do you find it um, working with the Lords compared to the Commons? So, uh, is it uh, do you find it harder? Perhaps you're kind of less familiar with the processes. Um, maybe it's something that actually you find it a bit easier because there's a bit less focus on, um, or it might be they're actually quite quite similar, or perhaps you haven't um, worked at um, that place. Even. So, we'll just kind of wait for. Um, your answers to come through on that um, and then I'll kind of take a look at um, one website in particular which might help you um, with the Lords. Uh, um, so uh, okay, uh, that's interesting, so there is uh, I think quite a split, um, uh, I guess, uh, but a lot of don't know, so um, perhaps people who haven't had um, enough experience working with the Lords and Commons um, uh, to really make a judgment, that's quite interesting. I think that uh, I think more people have said, uh, slightly more people have said it easier than harder. So um, uh, perhaps perhaps that's a sign that um, there is some uh, help out there. So um, the website which I find uh, which is really useful, which really helps me, is the uh, House of Lords Whips website, and that's got much more detailed information. So you've got your Lords business is all set out on um, on the parliamentary website. But this Lord's Whips website has got a whole lot more. Uh, it's got more detailed information. Uh, it's got a list of speakers, um, more details on what's happening, and some uh, briefings on bills as well. Um, so this is what uh, the thing that I find most useful is the speakers list. 
Um, so in the Commons, you can never find out who's going to speak and when. Um, in the Lords, uh, they're very uh, kind and they list everyone who's um, said that they're going to speak in a debate. So uh, rather than having to uh, send the briefing to everyone, uh, you can probably target it on people who are interested in the debate and are definitely going to speak. Um, so I think that is, uh, I find that particularly useful. Um, I want to take a quick look as well, at, um, so kind of look to what you can find out about what's going on, um, but also uh, the opportunity to watch uh, the stuff live, which has uh, been much improved in the last few years. Uh, so we've now got a live feed of every debate uh, and every committee. Um, so when I worked in Parliament uh, some years ago now, um, it wasn't actually possible to go back to a specific point in the debate. Uh, so if I missed what my boss had said, then I had to go back and watch the whole debate again. Um, so I'm very pleased that we're kind of beyond that and now have um, proper Parliament TV. Um, so looking at the page itself, uh, the event guide is how you can find individual streams you're looking for. Uh, so Commons and Lords will always be at the top. Um, and then if you've got a committee, it might just take you a little bit longer to find out a little, little bit further down, but it's, it's pretty easy to use, I think, in, in my experience. Um, and when Parliament TV was uh, redesigned, um, they also added a searchable archive as well. Um, so one thing just to make them are limited to the title of proceedings. Um, so you won't be able to capture all the times that your organisation or an issue is mentioned. Um, but if you know the debate you're looking for, um, you can now just like find it and go back and watch it. Um, and that applies to committees as well, so you can go back and get a committee. Some only have audio, but they're all there, I think. Um, and it goes the, the archive goes back back as far as December 2007, so quite quite a way back. Um, so sometimes I just find I think it's quite useful to be able to actually watch debates uh, and get a bit more more context than you do from the transcript. Um, but that might just be something that I kind of quite enjoy doing. Um, one kind of quite practical thing as well, um, the, the last like, nine ways we've got, is uh, recess dates. So recess dates are uh, just an important thing uh, to be able to get hold of quickly. Um, I try to put them in my diary so that I um, don't get in, get in that situation where I suggest to MPs um, that we do things in Parliament when they're not around. Um, but it's useful, I think, to just have that uh, link so you can check uh, when you need to. Uh, remember as well to check Lord's dates because they are sometimes slightly different. It's normally a, only a, a day or two either side, but um, yeah, you want to avoid um, not being aware that uh, the Lords are sitting in the Commons isn't. Um, so I think those are some of the most um, important uh, ways to follow official things that are happening through the website. Um, but I just want to talk briefly before we get on to Q&A about a couple of other ways uh, you can follow what's going on. Um, so Twitter, um, as we get a lot of our news uh, from it, uh, it's actually also really good for following what's going on in Parliament. So uh, BBC uh, Press Association have a number of parliamentary reporters who will uh, specifically focus on just kind of straight reporting of what's going on in Parliament at any point. Uh, there's also a really good account called Parliap, which is a, a lobby journalist um, set up, uh, which kind of does that, but it also looks at some uh, behind some of the procedures in Parliament. Uh, say quite um, informative. Um, and we talked a little bit about select committees, um, and they now tend to be on Twitter as well, so they're using a lot more to try and promote their, uh, the work they do, the evidence gathering they're doing, um, and they also sometimes uh, live tweet their sessions as well, which um, if you can't get to a, a stream um, can be quite useful. Um, I want to just very talk, uh, briefly talk about monitoring, but I thought we would um, have a, another quick poll question. Um, so uh, certainly I'm sure lots of the larger charities will have a paid uh, service to help them do parliamentary monitoring, but I wanted to get a sense uh, today whether uh, people use um, paid parliamentary monitoring. And also if you do, uh, whether it's something you find really useful, um, or perhaps not, and certainly in my experience it, it really kind of helps me to do my job, but I, perhaps not all, uh, all of you kind of uh, uh, get that same experience. And then if you don't use it, um, we thought it'd be useful to kind of go with an insight into why is it just because it's um, too expensive, uh, they can set you back kind of a fair bit, or um, is it something that you're just um, not sure is actually going to be useful um, for what you need. So just, um, again, wait for those uh, results to come through. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's probably not surprising. Uh, those of you that are able to get parliamentary monitoring uh, find it useful, and um, that doesn't surprise me. 
Um, and it, it seems that the major reason that if you don't have it is, is because of the expense reason, which I think um, that makes a lot of sense to me. So, but kind of interesting. Um, and it's, in, it's, it's interesting that a lot of you do get it actually. And it seems that. So, um, so what I wanted to, uh, to talk about then is so uh, if you can't get on the train, um, just a couple of um, fairly basic free ways. Um, in which you can do uh, some of the more basic things. So this isn't going to give you full parliamentary monitoring, um, but just some useful things to be able to do. So uh, they work for you. It's it's quite good at looking at the transcript, um, but it also allows you to set up alerts for when a particular word is used in Parliament. Um, there's a relatively new service as well called uh, Polymonitor, which covers Twitter. Um, so that allows you to set up alerts when a, a politician um, tweets a particular word or phrase. Um, and then the other thing to say is that Parliament uh, has a lot of really good uh, research services and they produce a lot of briefings. So you've got Commons Library, you've got Lords uh, Library, uh, you've got Parliamentary Office for Science and Technology. Uh, all of them do kind of really good, uh, relevant, topical um, policy briefings um, and you can use those uh, to keep in touch with what's going on. Okay, thank you. Chris. Um, I hope that everyone found that really useful. Um, so we're now going to move on to the Q&A session and we've had some questions come in. Um, so Leila has asked, um, is there a mailing list or a Twitter account for the Lord's Whips website? Is it just um, that's a good question. Um, I think there might be, I think there might be an email. I don't think there was a Twitter account actually. The Lord's is a bit um, they tend to be a bit more sparing um, with their accounts. Um, I could I could check that certainly, but um, uh, I think there is only kind of one main um, Lords account. So all of the committees, for example, don't have their own um, individual um, uh, individual accounts. Um, yeah. But there could but there could well be because a lot of these things do have complex sign up and information. So um, it's certainly uh, possible. Um, Please do, by the way, type your questions in as, as we go, mm -hmm. uh, if you've got any more th things. Yes, so, and then um, Louise has asked, um, who are the best MPs to contact regarding disability and equality issues, or maybe how do you find that out? Yeah, so there's, there's a few different ways you can you can look at this. So uh, I think people who are on relevant committees um, are always good. So there is a, a Equalities Committee, uh, there's Women and Equalities Committee, um, a lot of people on the uh, Department for Work and Pensions Committee are also particularly interested um, in some of those issues. Um, you can actually use a lot of the things I've talked about um, today. So uh, They Work For You, I think, is really good at just being able to um, search for what people have talked about in the past. Um, you can find a relevant debate um, on uh, issues related to disability and equality, and you can kind of look through the speeches and see <clears throat> who you think might be quite amenable to the, to what you said. So I think a lot of it is about just going back and, and seeing what people have said and, and what they're particularly interested in, um, if that helps. Okay, thank you. So um, then Roxanne has asked, um, do you have any advice for working or part of parliamentary groups? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I've always felt with um, all part of parliamentary groups that uh, it's really, it's very much about um, you get out what you put in. So I think um, there are some groups that are kind of they exist on the list, uh, exist on the register, but don't really do much during the year, and and you don't really kind of get much from those. Uh, whereas if you have a really good active group, um, then I think it can be really helpful. So I think it's worth doing a bit of um, horizon scanning on kind of where are the relevant groups, um, who runs them, and uh, trying to make sure you can get yourself on the list. And and, and uh, but I do find the ones that are actually. Uh, are making an impact and getting people um, and getting people involved. Um, and then, I, I mean, it might be that you want to um, think about uh, if you do want to kind of think about setting your, up your own. And there are a few other things to think about. Um, and we, uh, I think we did we did a blog quite recently where we had a bit of advice on, on staying in top of APPG. So um, you can take a look at that as well, um, as well as the things I've already mentioned. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, so uh, the next question is from Vicky, who has asked, um, do you think that the increasing importance of secondary le legislation will be reflected in increasing importance of the secondary legislation scrutiny committee? Um, yes, I think so. So there are, there are quite a lot of questions about this at the moment, because the 
repeal bill is going to go through and, and um, there are some questions around um, what happens with devolution, but I think for most MPs and certainly most uh, peers, I think the question is going to be, yeah, how do we make sure we scrutinise these? So at a moment you have a Lords Committee, uh, which takes a look at sort of all the all the secondary legislation that's um, going through, and it, it will recommend any which it thinks needs um, greater scrutiny. Um, I think they're going to be under a lot of pressure because I mean we are talking about um, we're talking about kind of at least a doubling of the number of these uh, things that are going through. Um, so I think there are definitely some kind of big questions about whether actually the, the current system is fit for purpose. Um, so one of the things that will be quite interested as we as we follow the um, appeal bill is whether um, we need to have some separate structures. And there have been some suggestions that actually you need to set up uh, a new committee uh, to look specifically at uh, secondary legislation arising from uh, Brexit. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of see how those debates go, but I, I certainly think that that kind of uh, um, additional scrutiny is going to be important in the years ahead. So um, the next question is from Jane, who's asked, um, how do you actually go about getting a matter um, onto the agenda for discussion? Um, and so can you can you ask for a question to be raised if the item is not on the agenda already? Um, yeah. So. Um, I think there are probably the two, um, so the first thing I think is about having, uh, making links with uh, parliamentarians, so having people who are prepared uh, to do something on your behalf, and then it's really thinking about what you want them to do for you, so uh, the easiest thing that any MP or peer can do is to ask listen questions, uh, there's no limit to the number um, you can table, um, so that's a pretty good um, strategy to get people um, to, to do things for you, um, but sometimes you can have more impact if you have uh, an oral question. So, uh, looking back to what I said about how you get about uh, getting MPs to uh, take oral questions or perhaps to brief them on something they've already got down. Uh, the other thing you can do, which I haven't really touched on today, is about uh, tabling for debates. So, in the, same, in the same way that people put their questions in, and they can also table for a, a specific debate on something. Uh, there are different types of different lengths. Um, but essentially, it's about kind of getting an MP interested, and then you can present them with some options. And they'll have some ideas of their own as well, because they'll always be interested in how they can, uh, they can do it. It's, it's, it's about building the links first, I think, generally. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, Essie has asked um, about bills. Where can you find the amendment, amendment groupings for bills? Um, yeah, so this is this is a bit of a nightmare actually because um, these are generally decided quite late on. Um, so it's often um, it's often kind of like on the day. Um, so they are published on I think they are published on the bill page, um, but most of the time you get them, it's kind of too late for you to really do much of it. You'll get a sense of when it's going to be debated, but you can't really sort of refine your strategy. So unfortunately, it's one of those things that you. Um, uh, you can kind of keep it in touch with later on, but it, it, it doesn't tend to be that much help when, when you do find out generally. But you can find out if it's not going to be debated, which I guess is helpful in itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the next question is um, how do you find out about petitions? Um, so uh, there's a couple of different things. So uh, there is um, a petitions, uh, so there's a petitions website that some of you might um, be aware of, and it's under the parliamentary uh, system, uh, and I'll have a list of all the uh, different petitions that have been put down. Um, but then there is also, uh, they are considered by the petitions committee, so there's a separate committee uh, which looks at which petitions um, they think are going to be most interesting, most relevant debate. Uh, worth saying they don't go just by weight of numbers, so uh, I think there is some suggestion that if it gets um, uh, 100,000, which should be um, subject to parliamentary debate, um, but the petitions committee have um, kind of looked at ones which are a bit smaller than that and, and chosen for those uh, to go through and get time to debate as well. So, um, yeah. Uh, we've also had a good question coming in um, about the recess dates that you showed us. Um, why do MPs have so much holiday? <laughs> um, well, it's, uh, they would argue, and I think I basically agree with this, that it's not holiday. Um, so obviously, like when you are, uh, when Parliament is not sitting, some of that time you might choose to go on a holiday, but um, they, they spend most of their time when we're in recess 
on um, on constituency business. So uh, doing you know having surgeries and, and seeing people or attending events. And um, so just because MPs aren't in Parliament doesn't mean uh, that they're not doing any work. Okay. Um, sorry. The next question is: How can you find out how MPs have voted? Um, yes, there's a few different ways. So um, it depends. It depends a little bit on what you want to find out. So uh, if you want to find out how people have voted in a particular division, um, then you, if you find the relevant debate, uh, it's kind of listed at the end where there are votes, or it's listed at the point where the vote was taken. Um, if you want to uh, find out about individual uh, MPs voting records, uh, then there is a site called uh, Public Whip, which has all of the, uh, which lists um, all of the MPs and you can kind of see uh, what they're based on, how often they've rebelled on things, um, and various other th things. And there is another relatively new thing as well. So um, a, a year or so ago, or a year or two ago, um, as well as saying, normally they, when people go to the lobby, they wrote down um, who voted which way, um, but they started recording it electronically as well. And uh, this has now been um, turned into an app, which I slightly and um, tragically have on my phone, uh, called Commons Votes. Uh, and uh, so if there's going to be like a tight race in Parliament, um, it comes up, uh, because they record it electronically, you can kind of have it on your phone. Uh, probably within a few minutes of it happening, uh, if there's a really interesting vote you're, you're particularly interested in. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, I think that's all we've got time for in terms of the questions today. Um, so just before we go, in case you found that useful, I just wanted to make you quickly aware of uh, some of the other training and events that we have coming up. So um, on 7th of September, it will be our campaigning conference uh, where we will have a range of different practical and strategic workshops and also um, a, a series of workshops on Brexit. And uh, Julie Bentley, the chief executive of Girl Guiding, will be a keynote speaker. Um, then we have the certificate in campaigning coming up. Um, it starts in October and you can apply for that now. Um, and uh, Chris is running um, a session on influencing select committees on 10th of November and then next year on 12th of March he's running um, another session on influencing parliament more generally. But uh, you can also find all of those on um, ncbo.org.uk slash training and events. And uh, lastly, can I just ask you again to please fill it in a short survey when you exit the webinar. And um, as Chris has already said, we will send you a follow-up email which will contain all the links that you've uh, seen today and also contain a list of the training and everything. But in the meantime, if you have any further questions, please uh, feel free to also tweet Chris um, at underscore C underscore Walker, right? <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much for watching. Bye.